Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the final of five gatherings that the Haven has been sponsoring, celebrating our 40th uh, anniversary of the founding of the Upper Valley Haven. I'm Michael Redmond, the current executive director of the Haven. On behalf of the employees, volunteers, and board of directors, thank you for attending today. Today's featured speaker is Sarah Kobolenski. Uh, her topic is Finding Hope and Discovering Possibility, The Haven as Ever Steady and Ever Changing. More in a bit about Sarah. But first, some housekeeping. Uh, our session is being recorded so that folks who are unable to attend today can watch at a more convenient time. Uh, due to the size of our audience, as you've noticed, we're using the Zoom webinar format. Everyone's been automatically placed on mute. Uh, Sarah welcomes questions and has provided time at the end of uh, her remarks to respond. Or if you have a question regarding one uh, something that comes up at a point for discussion, please use uh, the chat or the Q&A section on Zoom and we'll get to as many comments and questions as we can. As mentioned, today we're here celebrating the founding of the Upper Valley Haven, its work and role in the community over the past 40 years. A little history, on December 8th, 1980, a little more than 40, one years ago, the Upper Valley Boards of Directors signed Articles of Incorporation to form a new nonprofit organization. The group, including leadership and members of local churches who had been meeting informally since September in pursuit of a common goal, providing temporary shelter in the Upper Valley to those who were in need. By December, they were ready to make it official and according to the minutes from one of their early meetings, quote, to put their faith to work for an emergency shelter. The Haven opened its doors to its first guests almost exactly a year after incorporating on December 15th, 1981, just over 40 years ago. Since those early days, the Haven has grown in the number of staff, the breadth and depth of services, the number of buildings on our campus on Hartford Avenue, and the esteem in which it is held by the Upper Valley community. I expect Sarah will be reflecting on this history. Uh, while these and many other changes have occurred, what has remained consistent is our mission that could be simply say, stated that no one should be hungry, everyone should have a home. This story about the founding of the Haven was recounted in the first of the 40 stories that the Haven has been sharing since the beginning um, of this past year about the people, events, places, services, ideas fundamental to our mission. So 38 have been written so far, two to go, and we'll place a link in the series that can be found in the website on our chat, which I see has just occurred. Turning to our featured speaker, I'm extremely proud to introduce Sarah, my predecessor as executive director of the Haven, a fitting final speaker to our series. Sarah is a social worker by training and inclination and has worked with families and communities through that lens since 1969. She came to the Upper Valley in 1981 to work with another community created organization, the Upper Valley Youth Services. She was Vermont Division Director for the KC Family Services from 1984 to 2003, at which time she retired for the first time and moved into state government in Vermont to learn how the public sector works. She retired from there in 2009, retired, ha, <laughs> to come to the Haven. Since, uh, since retiring from the Haven, again, uh, uh, in 2018, she's worked with the Couch Family Foundation uh, toward their vision of young children and families thriving. She's also valued the opportunity to teach at the Community College of Vermont and to mentor social work students over the years. Sarah remains a longtime friend of the Haven and I'm pleased to have her as a friend and mentor. Thank you, Sarah, for agreeing to be a speaker in our series. Thank you, Michael. And um, what um, I have the privilege of knowing and those of you who are listening today don't know is that Michael just delivered that after doing an, like a three second turnaround <laughs> from testifying um, for a, um, a committee of the Vermont legislature. Um, this is the magic of Zoom right now. The, the negative side of Zoom is that I can't see you all. I can't feel your presence. I can't see a reflection in your faces of you know, where you're interested, where you're disagreeing, where you're wondering, um, where you're sleeping, um, although you can eat your lunch. Um, and I can see the list of who's participating. And there are so many of you that um, I have not seen in so very long that I really wish I could be spending this time in person with. So thank you for the gift of your time. Um, those of us who like to talk 
um, are totally dependent on the willingness of others to make the choice to be present and listen. And the, 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 the opportunity to, to have your ears is, is a gift to me. Um, and, uh, and I will note that, that there are many of you, and, 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 and you're, it's a gift to the Haven too. Every one of you has been a part of the Haven community in some way over all of these decades from, from way before my time of knowing anything except where the door was for, for bread um, at the bottom of the old farmhouse um, in the very early 80s um, up until this present time. Um, so thank you all for all of your investment over all these years and your time today. What I'm gonna to try to touch on um, are three things. The, the words in the title of this about finding um, hope and discovering possibility around the haven is ever steady and ever changing. And then the last piece that, that Michael had long ago asked if I would do, which is kind of sum up what it's meant to have the other four presentations and where there's some threads are across all of that. So the finding hope and discovering possibility is language that for me says some important things about the Haven. That phrase doesn't refer to the folks who are experiencing poverty or in need of access to resources and services. It's for everybody. What I mean by that is when the staff come through the doors, when the people who come to volunteer come through the doors, they start from a place of optimism, just as the people do who are in need of things that they don't have. They come because there is something that they are looking for, we look for within ourselves, that we, we are optimistic that we will be able to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves and that we will learn some things, find some ways to be able to be engaged in community together. So finding hope and discovering possibility for me can mean so many things and it can mean something unique for each individual. The Haven Ever Steady um, comes um, from that place where Michael, the one thing Michael did say to me was talk about the history. And the history is where I most easily find the Haven Ever Steady piece. There's a little piece about history. If you go to the website and there's a great paragraph and it talks about um, this founding of the Haven coming from this place of community caring and energy. And indeed, it was a Christian religious-based caring and energy at the time, but it was as broad as it could be within that context, and which was a, which was a, a, a forerunner of how things have evolved over time. It wasn't just one church. It was a couple of churches talking to each other and then reaching out and talking to other churches. And, 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 and that was the very beginning. And then there was this period of about 20 years, which is a long time for a small nonprofit organization to be really germinating and forming. It was a time in which the mission, as Michael referenced, and the principles and values came into being and were, were, were tightly grasped and really embedded. And that mission of shelter was where the group began in the farmhouse that where the footprint is still partially underneath the current Hickson house. The, the food mission, which began a couple of years later when the churches said, it's really clear that people are in need of food um, and that seems to go right along with this. 
education began in the 80s too. Um, people um, like Dee Dee Mackey and Katie Chaffee from the community were doing classes. Some of this was in response to people needing to do um, workforce training things in order to be eligible for any kind of public benefits. Um, part of it was because there was this sense that this ought to be more than just shelter. It ought to be ways of learning to have better opportunities for moving forward in life for people. And at the same time, it was in, in, in the early 90s and 91 that the, that the homework club uh, the crossover between education and children became part, part of the work. And, the, and all at the same time, those conversations with the Feenies who were the host couple in the shelter for so many years, was really the origins of problem solving. So, so those, those service functions um, really were all part of that 20 years. And then the values, the value statements have sometimes had some of the pronouns um, tinkered with, but basically the language of the, of the values is the same today, that we welcome all who enter our doors as equals, respecting your dignity and accepting you without judgment. I, I have had a recent experience in working with some um, community surveying around young children and their families and what makes a difference to them as they try to access services in the community. And it, the universal response was being accepted without judgment. That is what enables people to make connections and to be able to benefit in, 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 in their lives and whatever else is available. You can't access things unless you are accepted and can feel a connection and a belongingness. And the Haven from the very beginning has had that as the, as the first tenant in its values and the principles of operation. And it goes on. There are only you know, a short list here. That's the first one. The second one is we encourage those we serve and are in service to, to develop their capacity for independence and self-sufficiency. We're not about creating dependencies over time. It's about helping, it's about respecting people for who they are and for what they're capable of and helping to smooth pathways for them to be able to move as they wish. The third one is we seek the support and participation of the community, all of you. I, I would suggest to the board, you might wanna change the verb in that. I think that the Haven embraces the support and participation of the community. It's not a matter so much of seek, seeking it as embracing the gift of that support and participation that comes to the Haven. And the final one is we pledge to be thrifty with our resources, generous in our hospitality, and accountable to the organizations and individuals that support us. That has not changed over these decades and is part of the steady anchoring that is the Haven. The, I have pieces of notes all over my desk here, which is when I'm not walking back and forth and talking and I have to sit still, this is my compensation for that. The, um, you know, the, those five program areas, the four program areas, and then the children is in those additional. So five program areas. And these values are, are really the core of the Haven and they are the how of the Haven, you know, the, I'm sorry, they're not the how, they're the what. This is the what, this mission of these programs and then these values. That is the what of the Haven. The how of the Haven is the part that's ever changing. And 
that's where there really is so much more to say because that that how is what has evolved so much over the years and continues to evolve and probably at an ever more rapid pace. And that in my mind, in terms of sequencing leads me to talk about the four presentations that some of you have had a chance to be, to hear or to, or to participate in some or all of. They are all on, on the Haven website. The recordings are there. Um, and they are um, a, a remarkable group um, of folks who did two things. They gave presentations in their areas of experience and expertise and in their connection to the Haven. And they gave us some other messages too that, that I hear through my lens and my experience of the Haven. The first presentation was by Bob Drake, who is a psychiatrist and probably one of the most self-effacing and, and just quietly remarkable um, people who has brought his gifts as a volunteer to the Haven for many years now. And he talked about the, about, he was talking about mental health and work. Um, what he didn't tell you was that he is also a researcher and he has done extensive study in this area, as well as lived experience, which led him to tell the story of three different people who could have been dismissed as not being um, significant contributors to the community until they were given a chance to have meaningful work and therefore have purpose in their own lives. And having purpose through work allowed them to be helpful and have meaning for others. And, you know, his, he, his message was, he was really looking at these as whole people, not parts of people or wounded people, but as whole people. And so they were allowed to find that purpose and make that contribution to the community. And, and for me, there was that reinforcement of the Haven value of accepting people for who they are and promoting that independence and self-sufficiency. And there was also a little message beginning to develop about research and data and learning that could then be applied in practice. The second presenter was Elizabeth Carpenter Song, who I know is here with us today. And she talked about families and the circuitous, circuitous path that they take to achieving, you know, through, through the challenges of poverty, of trauma, of disrupted relationships, to that, to that place of security and competency in their own lives. And I'll note that, that Elizabeth connected with the Haven at a point when we were just trying to figure out how to maybe be able to work more intentionally and more deeply with the folks who were spending time in the shelters. And it was out of her, her research mind again, her accumulation of, of data and experience that that change came and came into practice. I have notes from a meeting on October 11th of 2010 with her, where she said, we came out in the conversation, what if we could predict to people while they were in the Haven that they would be lonely when they left the shelter and that would impact how they were able to move forward on the goals that they so positively and enthusiastically set forward, set forth for themselves while they were in the shelter. 
And that conversation, other conversations, other, other work around this was what led to engagement in the Family Supportive Housing Program, where there are staff members who stay connected to families for two years and even more after they've left the shelter to be able to, to you know, add those balance wheels to the bike, to be able to help with that sense of connection and community and not more abandonment as people try to move forward um, toward, toward that self-sufficiency and independence. And you know, again, there was that listening to people and, and recognizing where something more might be needed, but doing it through a lens of what people were capable of doing for themselves, and then the data and research. And then the next month, John Sales came to speak. And he, as the um, director of um, the Vermont Food Bank, and he, he talked about this whole issue of, of, of food insecurity, um, of hunger, and that, um, you know, and he talked about food as a humanitarian necessity. He also said that hunger is the world's greatest solvable problem. And where that resonated for me is in a whole underlying framework about the haven, which is a mindset of thinking from abundance, not from scarcity. Um, in my opinion, which is never so humble, in my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes that the nonprofit sector does is tends to think from a scarcity mindset. What we can't do, what we won't have the resource for, resources for, what we can't afford. I grew up with a Midwestern bred mother who constantly said, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Take the risk as long as it's reasonable. And that's a mindset really of abundance of thinking we can do this, we have to figure out how. And when, when folks connected to the Haven, the folks who came as volunteers and then the folks over years, the years who have come as part of the, the formal staff have encountered circumstances and they've talked about that to others in the community, told the story of the need, the community has responded. And that's what I mean by thinking from abundance, the possibilities are there, that the answers can be found. And that's what John Sayles said, that hunger is the world's greatest solvable problem. And with leadership like that in the food community in Vermont, maybe here we can do that. It's possible. And then the final speaker um, last month in December was Matt Slaughter from the Tuck School, who talked about what's happened to American families in 40 years. And by the way, John used lots of data lots of information to frame his thoughts about, about hunger and about food. And Matt likewise was, was the master of the, the PowerPoint and the, the trend lines and the charts over time. And, and his, his, you know, his picture of, of the fact that he talked about, you know, what has happened to the American dream? Is the American dream fading? Is it, is it not as attainable? Is the notion that our children will have better opportunities and do better in life than what we've had the opportunity to do, that the, always the next generation is in a place ahead? And that's, and that's challenged at this point. And he had some notions about what it would take to turn that, to, to make an economic 
he was talking in economic frameworks ab about the well-being of families and talked about education. And he talked about ongoing education and talked about the need for new learning and new ways of knowing over the lifespan. And again, he was presenting ways in which what we're experiencing now could be different if we made that choice. So, you know, there is this, this sense that for me, that there is a community picture that the Haven is always striving to understand, you know, what's happening in the economy, you know, what's possible to address, what does it take, what are the, where are the areas that there can be impact, and then how can the Haven internally in its own functioning do shelter and food and problem solving and education and opportunities for kids? How can those things be done better and in more relevant ways all the time? The, one of the, the evolutions, one of the ever-changing pieces has been the connection of the Haven to the community. In those first couple of decades, the Haven really was doing its bit of work and was pretty insular, um, really needed to focus the volunteers, um, folks coming together to do the work and the mission of the Haven were very much focused on doing that. But at the same time in the Upper Valley community, there was a rich evolution of other nonprofit organizations and of connections between the nonprofit sector, the education sector, the business sector. And, and it was with intentionality that the board wanted to turn to that um, um, in, 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 the, in the past dozen years. And it took some time to build that. But, but it has been so rich and so meaningful and is a, a really important piece of the Haven story going forward. The, the, when you think about shelter, the partnerships between Twin Pines Housing um, and the Haven, um, the, the work with, with an entire um, housing continuum, um, and and then the groups that you know, like Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, the the New Hampshire Housing Coalition, the Vermont Coalition and Homelessness. These groups are made up of all of the different entities and individuals who are working together around those issues, and for the Haven to be part um, of those networks has been really significant in terms of the learning that the Haven has done, and then the contribution toward the bigger picture that the Haven has been able to make. In the area of food, working together with willing hands and with listen, um, and with um, all of the groups that are part of the, 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 um, the food coalitions in the area, with Hunger Free Vermont, with the food banks in both states, um, there has been, and then with all of the, the farmers who have been, been part of, of building the food resources for the Haven uh, has, um, and, and, and the grocery stores, um, the, the co-op food stores, um, and both their pennies for change, but also their help in designing the layout of the food shelf in, in, and in their, their sharing of, of product um, um, to, to stock those shelves. Um, all of these kinds of partnerships have been, have been huge. It's, it's 
it's it's volunteering um, at at a at a level that's that that means something very special to the haven. But there's a reciprocity. It's you know where can the haven bring its energy and its and its knowledge um, to the well to the benefit of 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 the others. Um, in Education is an interesting one to think about in terms of how the Haven has grown and, and changed over time. Um, I mentioned that the, the homework club was started in the early 90s and it was a Dartmouth professor um, and students that came to do that. And, and uh, you know, up, through, up until COVID, Dartmouth students were still coming to help with the delivery of that service. And at the same time, they were learning about community and they were learning about social class and they were learning about, um, uh, about children. Um, they, were, they were learning about being part of a bigger system. And education, has evolved in other ways too, um, it, all through partnership, all through partnership. The, um, the Tuck School, the Geisel School, the mentors, the leaders from, um, from um, the, the teaching in those environments have brought their knowledge, have brought their students to, to grow um, health programs on the campus to um, Tuck has had uh, Tuck students have been um, have been members through the Rivers Board program have been have been fellows um, on the Haven Board um, for over twenty years and every year and um, and I know there are some that are on in in this event too today um, the um, so, so education has been has been generously provided to the Haven um, in in these formal ways, and in response, the Haven has worked to to be able to share knowledge and understanding around poverty and the experience of poverty, and 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 really the the concept. Um, of, 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 of equity um, and inclusion um, as, as a way, as, as part of, of a lens for, for breaking down barriers. Um, the, the work with AHA process, which is the Bridges Out of Poverty and um, the, which then spun off the Working Bridges program, which has been part of Vital Communities, and then the United Way, um, um, you know, are, are all things that, that have been nurtured and fostered as part of the Haven's gift into education in the community. And now this conversation, this, this series that, that the Haven has put together um, of, of these five conversations. That's something that had been talked about for a long time at the Haven and um, really hadn't been, been quite ready to, to see if this would be something that would be helpful and useful to the community to have, to know some of the things that, that we've come to learn inside the Haven and use as part of the way of figuring out how to make decisions what to choose to do, how to take actions. So constant learning and education loops. And the, um, and the, um, and then the problem solving um, is, is perhaps the piece that's nearest and dearest to my heart. The notion that, that there, is, there is a skill involved there is there is an, a knowledge framework about how best to help people through processes of change how to help them to experience their own power their own knowledge 
and to, to move forward in the ways that they're ready to do at the pace they're ready to do it. Um, and that has involved a huge network of partners um, in linking folks and um, using what this community has richly developed. The, um, I remember one board meeting when we were, the staff was trying to share some about their work, the case managers on the staff, the service coordinators. We've gone through lots of names for this role because there really isn't a good name. Um, uh, you know, I, I still haven't figured out one. I, I, for a period, I like case manager, but then people aren't cases, they're people. And service coordinator, well, yeah, you're kind of coordinating the services, but that doesn't speak to why you're doing that in any sort of way. Lots of vocabulary problems here. But the service coordinators were trying to help the board to understand what was involved in their work. And we ended up with this, this construction paper pinwheel thing um, that had more than, than 58 other organizations in the immediate Upper Valley area that were part of what it took to do problem solving. So never alone, always with partnership, um, always with curiosity. I'm watching the time right now and I really had wanted to be sure that I could hear your comments and your questions and your reflections. Uh, but, and so what I wanna do is give a couple of more comments and then move to that. Comments that I would make now um, are that this decade that we're in now with the Haven, the work that Michael is leading, I see is really building deeply on what has come before, just as, as the team and the time that I was part of built on Tom Ketteridge's time, built on, on um, built on, on Suzanne Stoplitz and the Feenies that, you know, now Michael has gone on. We you know that during Tom's time, the, the burn building um, was, was, was created and the plans for the new Hickson house and the Beverly Fowl Fiertz house, um, Bev's house um, was added um, to, to the Haven footprint. And now Michael has added a property to the South, um, which used to be the Montire Properties Building. And there is work going on in partnership with both St. Paul's Church and Twin Pines Housing to be able to use that tract of land where St. Paul's Church and Parish House have been for, for emergency housing for more office and program space and still retain um, a, um, a congregation space there for the church. So there's growth in that area. There's growth in the relationships with, at the state level with both states. There's, um, there's, there's growth in um, the, the scope and the number of food programs and the distribution of food off of the campus. I stopped in to visit with Michael last week and I had this deja vu experience about Tropical Storm Irene. Some of you will remember what the halls look like during Irene. Well, this was a bit of a version of it if you were able to be in the Haven right now, but it's all about food and food being readied for distribution out into the community um, for redistribution at other sites. Huge expansion in the ways in which food is, is, is going into the community. Um, you know, the, the work on bringing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion into the understanding is an overlay for understanding about social class and poverty is work that's going on now. So building on everything in all of the areas about sheltering, about food, about education, problem solving, new horizons for all of those areas. And the final thing that I would say and in, in what I wanted to share with you right now was that about 45 years ago, um, a very special mentor that I had in social work practice said to me, 
if you are lucky, you will still be in this work in 30 years. And she said, always be humble. Know that you're going to work to do the best you can do with what you know in the moment all the time. But 30 years down the road, people will turn around and they will say the equivalent of what were they thinking? And that would be a good thing because it means that there's been evolution, there's been healthy growth and change. So I have you know, no sense of shame about the things that are seen now as mistakes and missteps. They were the best that we could do with what we knew. And if you can see them in that kind of way and know that what's happening now is better, and 30 years from now, there will still be something better if the work stays on course with the values and adherence to the mission that's in place. So Michael, I'll stop and say, are there any questions um, or are we giving people back their time? No, no, we're, there are going to be questions and I start with me and I'll, I'll go and encourage and remind everyone, please use the chat or the Q&A. Not only questions, but observations, challenges. Uh, Sarah Alexa, a good argument if you got if you got the stuff to bring it. Uh, so um, I thought I'd like to start off with a, a thought, Sarah, about your role as a, a clinical social worker. That wasn't just nothing. That was something in this evolution of the haven. And I think it's one of the distinguishing characteristics of our, uh, perhaps of our formation for the kind of work in the, the field in which we are practicing. Why, why is that important to you? And what was it that, that having that clinical background lends to the, either what distinguishes us or makes us better as an organization? I think that between, I, 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 I think that that enabled me to, to help others come, first of all, it, 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 it is, a, is, a, is a collaborative mindset. It's a team mindset. Um, and that very much had been part of the story of the Haven. But I think what was different was, um, was a commitment to saying, we need to take some responsibility for going beneath the surface to go deeper to be able to really use this as a time in people's lives that, um, that, that they can have some keys to open some doors for themselves. And that, um, and, and, you know, that is a tough question, Michael. <laughs> the, um, you know, the, um, I, I, th I think that um, that honoring of people and, um, and, 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 and welcoming them to be part of, of their own journey, their own solutions, that, that I, I think what it was is that it was a stance, a point of view. I remember often giving to new staff a short article, a one-page article that says, this isn't about help. This is about being in service to people. And that was part of the clinical social work mindset was to be in service, not to be helping. One is something you do with people, the other is something you do to people. And doing to people isn't useful, really. Um, yeah, I remember um, Amy, uh, uh, who you know here, once wrote a story about walking behind uh, one of her clients in, in, yeah. uh, in support. And I thought that image yeah. was uh, one that's, that has stayed with me. And, uh, and I think well, it, it spoke a lot uh, about that. You first, you walk alongside and then you walk behind and then you let go. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so uh, one other thing I'd like to ask you too about the role of the Haven that goes beyond services of thinking at larger levels. And you mentioned some of the uh, work of working with other organizations as partners, but some of the other, I think maybe difference that you brought and that we've continued is how we serve to 
advance the resources and maybe to address root causes. Is that something that is peripheral to us as in your mind, or is that really also key to how we are we can be successful in our work? I I think that I, I think that that is really um, a responsibility of a mature organization. I think in early years, organizations can't necessarily take on that kind of role in relation um, to their mission. But I think that with the kind of um, stability, the kind of maturity that the Haven has, um, that looking at root causes, looking at to the extent that the Haven can can address specific things, but then if, the, if it's not within the Haven's mission to do the actual addressing, how can it educate about those things so that others have the opportunity, the knowledge, um, have tools that they need to have to be able to be addressing them. Um, and, and again, that's where, where partnerships, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, with, with business, um, um, you know, with, with um, senior educational um, entities really can make a difference too. Um, and, and then in, 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 and in the governance section, uh, sector, um, being able to help um, inform um, legislators, policymakers, those who set out the rules um, and on the administrative side of government after legislation has been passed, what does it mean if you do something this way versus that way down at the end of the day for the people that you're trying to actually impact with that and communicating those things, I think is a responsibility that an organization like the Haven can well carry. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Don Kalish asked a question. Um, many thanks for the great talk and your mentorship for teaching you've provided to our medical students and residents from Geisel. Could you comment on trends in training social workers in these contentious times? What can we all do to train, nurture, and pay for many more social workers who are, like you, compassionate and wise and tireless? Snuck in a compliment there, too. <laughs> I see that. And I appreciate that, Don. And, and there is a major effort going on in the, in the medical community now where there is work to really um, infuse um, um, the humanities into the education of people who aspire to be part, who, to, to be medical providers, to help them really be able to appreciate people as people and as whole beings, not just as diseases or body parts. And I, I think some excellent work is going on in this community around that. And um, in social work, uh, I think that, that frankly, there was, a, there was a period of time in which social work got a little bit worried about being sufficiently pedantic and sufficiently, um, you know, um, sophisticated that it lost a little bit of its grounding, um, really in helping to prepare people in what used to be called the planful use of the self in relation to the other. And being able to really take that um, neutral open stance of curiosity and acceptance of people where they were. And instead of perceiving people as in opposition or resisting, see them as persisting in something that had been working for them. Um, and somehow though wasn't getting them to where they were. So I think that there are some things in social work education that are going back to some, some pretty functional kinds of um, um, roots at this point. Thanks. Um, Judith comments, I think it goes back to your thoughts about values and uh, the welcoming uh, organization. Uh, she says, one of the reflections of your social work mindset is the language choices at the Haven. Recipients of Haven residential services are guests, not clients. Um, and that, those who come for food are visitors, yeah. also not clients. The guests are those who have you know, who, who, who have a, um, who have a bed yeah. and, um, and, and it's some, some uh, both respect and humor um, with that the staff chose that in about 2010, chose that specific language about guests. Um, and, and that is to say that when you have a guest in your home, it's still your home and they are not there permanently, they're there for a while. 
and that there's a certain kind of um, code of responsibility between a host and a guest. Right. And, um, um, it, and, does, and it influences behavior on both sides and language exactly. and, and how, how we treat each other. And I think that's- Exactly. And we you know, maintain that and we'll always will. Um, I have a question from a current board member uh, thinking about you know, what you mentioned in the project that we're uh, working on now to add to our, our campus. And uh, Jim Zion asks, reflecting on your leadership era, era, how would you characterize the Haven's relationships interactions with its residential neighbors? So um, overall, actually quite good um, with um, some, some events that occasionally come up. Um, I think the, an example of quite good was the relationship with Phyllis Morris, who has recently sold her property to the Haven um, as her preferred choice because of the relationship we had with her as our closest neighbor to the South. Um, the, um, there was only one residential neighbor across the street um, who would come over episodically to visit and just check in, um, but in a, in a positive kind of way. Um, the neighbors to the north um, were originally um, part of a vocal group that was not happy about the construction of the Hickson House uh, shelter um, that was approved by the town in 2008 and finally opened in, in um, May of 2000 or June of 2010. Um, but um, over time, communicated with us um, that they were comfortable with what came into being and came into place. Um, I understand now that with the work um, anticipated with the development that is being, um, hopefully will be um, accepted by the town very shortly. Um, and will be able to happen um, on the track that is St. Paul's, that there is one particular neighbor who is worried um, about what the implications are. Um, and, um, and, and, and the same respect for that neighbor's concerns and keeping good communication right. um, will be important. Agreed. And that's one of the things I've taken away from this is it, the values that we have that if the folks who come to us for uh, support um, or with uh, challenges that they like some help with uh, uh, that same idea of being open and not judging and uh, understanding where people are coming from is uh, is important and things that I will be working on, have worked on and, and can do more. I mean, always you look at your time and you think of um, the, the, the folks that are in, important in your uh, the audience of, of allowing your work to be successful and um, certainly I'm adding that uh, to my list of, of, of uh, opportunities and, um, and needs. Um, uh, Joan uh, writes uh, uh, to you as uh, maybe some guidance for me, which I would welcome, <laughs> always do. Being away from the day-to-day -day management for a few years, what do you imagine is at the very top of the Haven's current wish list? <laughs> I am gonna defer that one to you, Michael. Yeah, what right. is at the top of your wish list right now? Well, I think you know we're just coming off of strategic planning, um, you know, following in in the footsteps that you and the path that you le left me and the board when you left was to say, um, you know, to settle in for a, a few years, uh, use the guidance that was provided by your, yourself and the board uh, under uh, Merritt's uh, Patridge's leadership, uh, and uh, to then imagine uh, to dig in to. Uh, understanding the world as it is. Don't assume that things are as they are. Go, understand what your strengths are and the, the, your, um, you know, be inside your um, mission, not to add scope unless it's deliberate. And I think that's what we saw was that about one of the key ideas every 10 years or so, you, you got to look at your, um, the, the team you have, what you've built and what's inherited. Uh, how does it work? How do you address then the immediate and the long term. The immediate then becomes the pandemic. And so our work over the last two years almost, almost half the, my time here, more than really, has been focused on maintaining safety for the team uh, and service to the community. Uh, and I think we've done really proud of how we pulled together the board, um, the 
staff, the volunteers, and the community that supports us. I think that's one other thing that you haven't mentioned as much. When we say community supports us, we mean literally that um, you know, 85 to 90 percent of our budget you know, comes from individuals. We have 5,000 donors who uh, support the Haven with a financial contribution. The volunteers, 600 who come here at some point during the year, that is the community coming together uh, to support us. And as we looked around uh, to keep a focus on our mission of shelter and housing, uh, because I think expanding that, the work that we do in support of housing is as important as we do in shelter, of thinking of that continuum and, and adding that to the way we describe ourselves. And in food, that not only everything occurs here, you mentioned, we now are working with 12 partners with uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock being one of the largest ones of providing food to where people are and in the circumstances in which they need it and focus on the quality of that as well. And so as we think about that, we said, well, we're hamstrung uh, some, not by our mission, but by our capacity to deliver services. And that's why we're looking at a new um, space uh, that to support that program that uh, will allow us to provide shelter whenever anybody needs it, thinking of those low barrier in the winter. When we were, you know, to your credit, we said, we're gonna do it and we put it in the cafe, which is really cramped and not great under pandemic conditions, not great for trauma informed. So we can create a space that does reflect the, the needs and of, uh, of people that goes to, they have pets. We wanted people to come in. We don't want them sleeping in their cars. And then to the daytime to work on those solutions that are focused on helping them uh, be the independent to the degree they're ready and also the pathway that they wanna follow that we can support them. And to create a day station and community uh, service uh, facility is where we see where we can bring the best. You know, the Gwens and the Nancys and the other service coordinators who understand this community so much and so well, who have having done it uh, here for a while, but to give them the space and where we can bring in partners uh, each day uh, of the wise or uh, headrest or turning point or HIV AIDS, and you name them, uh, uh, the Good Neighbor Health Clinic, uh, Geisel School, that we have place where we can work together in that place, a location and uh, work. So I hope that's at the top of your list because it certainly is at the top of my list in the boards and that's what we're working on. Um, I, I, and if I could just say a couple of other tiny things that, are, that, are, yeah. that I've observed too, um, that when you talk about the 85% of the budget being private dollars from a broad span of people, that is an incredibly powerful message to be able to use in speaking truth to power in the government sector. And that's something that the Haven has relied on as we have made the choice to use our voice on behalf of the community. Um, and to be able to say 5,000 people in our community are supportive and this percentage of our budget, we are, we are not doing this with government dollars, except in the area that the government is supposed to be paying for. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and those dollars can be accessed. Yeah. Then the other thing is people. I, you know, I've noticed that Lisa, who is one of um, the staff, um, who is furthering her education, made the comment yeah. about person first. And I'm saying, mm, you just passed the social work test today. <laughs> um, and and you know, you're gonna be needing to fill the position um, of the senior position because Renee has been tapped um, in the office of the Secretary of Human Services in the state of Vermont. Um, and, and again, you know, you're beginning to export people into significant spots. Um, Ellen going to work with vital communities around housing uh, because of her expertise developed in her years at the Haven. So, so, you know, folks broadening out and bringing some of this Haven experience to other places. So the Haven growing, um, and, um, and, and it's, and it's 1259. I will stop talking. Thank ever you, Michael, for the opportunity. Yeah. Ever steady, ever changing. I think we've demonstrated that uh, today. Thank you, Miss, for calling out Lisa too. Uh, the social, the shelter staff are backbone of the organization. Um, uh, but, um, thank you, Sarah, for agreeing to be, uh, the speaker in our series and our final speaker and to sum up everything. This is the final session, everyone. I hope that you've enjoyed listening to the folks who agreed to celebrate 
our 40th anniversary. I'd like to thank them again for their generosity of spirit, wisdom, and kindness that Sarah mentioned, Dr. Bob Drake, Elizabeth Carpenter Song, John Sales, Matt Slaughter, and now Sarah Kobolensky. Thank you too in the audience for having joined us for these sessions. Your questions have been great, and I appreciate your hearing your comments and ideas. Perhaps we'll keep the speaker series going next year too, if there's interest. Uh, in the meantime, please share the link to the series of recordings with friends. Laura will be getting that out uh, shortly. Thank you, Laura, for your steadfast support on tech. This was the best tech series I have seen of speakers in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, uh, COVID era. Um, and But thank you, uh, everyone, for your support of the Haven. We're only able to accomplish the good we do through the support of the Upper Valley community. Be well, everybody, and uh, have a prosperous and peaceful day. Bye-bye.